the body of a woman discovered by accident along the North Canadian River in eastern Oklahoma County. Sheriff's Office says the killer used lime in an attempt to try to decompose the body. To this day, investigators do not know who the victim is. She's buried without a name. She's known only at this time as the lime lady. Investigators aren't any closer to finding out who this woman was or who killed her. That is the most frustrating thing about this because we can't even begin to figure out who killed her, who is responsible for her death until we figure out who she is. For January and February's Patreon case poll, I decided to let patrons choose between three different Jane Doe cases that have intrigued me for quite some time. The first of which was an unidentified woman nicknamed the Lime Lady. It has been almost 39 years since she was first discovered in Oklahoma, and it seems police are no closer to finding her killer or Jane Doe's true identity, and she remains nameless. Friday, April 18th, 1980, a group of fishermen gather along the shores of the North Canadian River, about one and a half miles east of the town of Jones, which is located 20 miles northeast of Oklahoma City. Jones is a quiet community of only 2,200 in 1980, but what the men found that day disturbed that peaceful existence for Jones residents. Along the east bank of the river, in the brush, the fishermen find the nude body of a deceased woman covered from head to toe in a white, powdery substance, later discovered to be lime. Now, lime has several uses, and many detective and mystery novels have cited it as a way to hasten decomposition of a body in order to prevent police from identifying the victim. However, lime's fictional reputation doesn't correlate to its real-life function. It is actually utilized to prevent putrefaction and thus discourages the gathering of flies or other scavengers and when mixed with water, it actually helps preserve remains. In Jane Doe's case, the moisture in the air from the nearby river was enough to, quote, mummify her, according to Oklahoma County Sheriff's Office Captain Bob Green. While she was still in a state of decomposition, the killer's blunder with the lime aided the medical examiner in determining several important clues about Jane Doe, whom law enforcement dubbed the Lime Lady. Due to the state of her remains, the state medical examiner's office was able to determine that Doe was 18 to 25 years old. She had a fair complexion dotted with freckles along her upper torso and face. Standing between 5 feet 6 and 5 feet 7 inches tall, she had a slender build at 115 to 120 pounds. There have been different descriptions of her hair color over the years, from light brown to blonde, but... More recent reports describe it as reddish-brown and shoulder-length. Unfortunately, the coroner was unable to definitively declare her eye color, but did note that she appeared to have had extensive dental work, despite having some crooked teeth. There was no clothing or unique jewelry to note, no fractures or signs of sexual assault. However, the autopsy did find several points of interest. First, along Jane Doe's left breast was a professional-grade heart tattoo measuring about one centimeter. The inner heart was shaded in red, outlined in blue, and adorned with a looping line on either side. Second, she had an appendectomy scar along her lower abdomen that measured four centimeters long by one centimeter wide. Now, most sources on the Lime Lady's case mention the appendectomy scar, However, on NamUs, or the National Missing and Unidentified Person System, Jane Doe's profile reads, On the lower abdomen above the level of the pubic hair is a fenin steel type scar measuring 4 centimeters by 1 centimeter. The scar is horizontal. 
So this fan and steel scar measures the same length as the aforementioned appendectomy scar. However, those scars would look very different based on what the incisions are used for. The fan and steel incision is typically used for C-section births or abdominal hysterectomies and falls just above the pubic area where the McBurney or Lanz incisions are utilized for appendectomies, a little higher and to the right side. Also, scars from C-sections typically run 10 to 15 centimeters. At 4 centimeters, Doe's scar falls closer to the appendectomy range of 5 to 7.5 centimeters. Some have speculated that this particular detail on Namus's profile could indicate that Doe has both a fan and steel scar and an appendectomy scar, which is entirely possible. If she does have the former, it indicates she might have given birth in her lifetime. However, considering Namus is the only source that mentions the fan and steel, and every other source, including the most recent ones, list the scar as an appendectomy scar, and both are described as the same dimensions, 4x1, I'm thinking there's only one scar, the appendectomy. Unfortunately, Namus' system isn't perfect, and sometimes there are mistakes on it. It's not entirely impossible that she has two scars, but I think the likelihood of a fan and steel incision being six centimeters below the shortest length is low. However, I wanted to make sure and mention it. I'm going to continue to side with a majority of sources which say that it is an appendectomy scar until and unless we have official word that contradicts that information. Another point of interest mentioned in only one source was a 2014 report by Oklahoma News 4 that said authorities believe Doe was possibly a dancer. There's no further elaboration on how they reached this conclusion. Finally, the Lime Lady's death. Original sources place her possible date of death in early 1980 or sometime in 1979. However, more recent publications say that she perished anywhere from 10 days to about two weeks prior to her discovery. And this is what most sources are still reporting. Her official cause of death was homicide by gunshot. The coroner determined Doe was shot three times in the chest with 45 caliber bullets. Each shot came from a different distance away, possibly indicating the killer was walking or running toward the victim while shooting. According to Captain Bob Green, one shot was actually a contact wound, meaning the muzzle of the firearm was against the body whenever it fired. But digging deeper, this wasn't the only thing Jane Doe's bullet wounds told investigators. The medical examiner extracted a dime from inside of one of Doe's wounds, along with clothing fibers. Authorities believe that Doe was clothed when she was shot, and that the bullet hit the dime that had been in a pocket of some kind, forcing it into her body. And because there was no clothing found at or near Doe's body, detectives believe she was killed elsewhere, and that the banks of the North Canadian River only served as a dumping ground. Captain Bob Green speculates that she was actually dragged through the brush based on her arms being, quote, splayed out backward, saying that while this particular point is just speculation on his part, it aligns with everything else they know so far. Jones Police Department and the Oklahoma County Sheriff's Office combed along the river, searching for any more clues, and reached out to the public, asking for an aid in identifying Doe. By April 24th, law enforcement had received multiple calls from all over the state, mostly from mothers worried that Doe was their runaway or missing child. But none of those inquiries turned up new leads. Even with the assistance of the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, OSBI for short, all authorities had to give the public were composite sketches and a more lifelike reconstruction of the victim released in August 1980. The OSBI ran Doe's fingerprints through their system, but there was no match. Sketches and renderings prompted some tips to trickle in, but there's been nothing of substance to move the investigation forward. They had no matches to their dental records or missing person databases, and no other law enforcement agency authorities had contact with offered any matches as well. 
Jane Doe still has no name, background, or family to connect her to. This, of course, means we are left to speculations by law enforcement, online sleuthers, and official rule-outs concerning Doe's identity and that of her killers. Based on where the body was found, Chief Deputy Carson Marshall, who was actually on the scene the day that Doe was discovered, believes the Lime Lady's killer, or killers, could be local to the area. Her location only has one way in and out using a secluded path just off of Britain Road, one that Marshall says, quote, you'd have to know was there to drive down it. And while fishermen sometimes parked at the end of the road and walked the remaining way to the river, Doe's location was well concealed from the road, possibly indicating the killer knew the area. However, we can't know this for sure. Several publications also briefly mention the possibility that Jane Doe fell victim to one of the violent outlaw biker gangs frequenting the area at the time. Captain Green points out that a 45 caliber weapon was a reported favorite amongst these gangs and that Jones did have a biker bar in the 1980s. No specific gang names have ever been mentioned by law enforcement or the sources that I could find. As for Doe's identity, Captain Green believes it's possible she was a runaway or foster child that hadn't been reported missing by her guardians or her parents, and that while she could be local, almost four decades with no ID means she could have also come from really anywhere. NamUs has listed 20 official rule-outs concerning her identity, and I am going to list them for you here. From California, the rule-outs include Rose Cole from Oakland, who went missing September 1st, 1972, and Alma Root from Auburn, missing January 1st, 1980. Maria Ann Hiras, who went missing from Norwalk, Connecticut on February 12th, 1976, and Tina Kemp from Delaware, vanished on February 3rd, 1979. Florida has three rule-outs. Amy Billig, who went missing from Coconut Grove March 5th, 1974. Susan Hallowell from Melbourne, who vanished sometime in 1980. And Carol Dawn out of West Palm Beach. Carol has two listed dates that she went missing, but both are actually after Doe was discovered, so I'm unsure why she was considered a candidate in the first place, but nonetheless, authorities have officially ruled her out. Margaret Hayes disappeared from Bloomington, Indiana, March 10, 1977, while Nancy Jason went missing from Bethesda, Maryland, later that same year on July 20th. Out of Davison, Michigan, Paulette Jaster vanished May 5, 1979. However, her remains were actually identified in 2014. She had been the victim of a hit-and-run in Houston, Texas back in 1980. This next one's a little strange. There's a rule out listed from Missouri with the first name unknown and the last name Butterfield. There's no link to an actual profile or a full name or a date of disappearance, and there's no one listed in the Charlie Project or the Doe Network with the last name Butterfield in the United States. Not sure how they could also know her last name, but not her first. It is possible they meant that the individual was from Butterfield, Missouri, which is a small township in the southwestern part of the state. I've never seen a rule out like this before, and it's kind of odd, but I wanted to make sure it is included. Oklahoma, where Doe was found, had several rule outs. First is Linda Davis, who vanished from Claremore on January 7, 1976. Then Teresa Cups out of Oklahoma City sometime in 1977. Kathleen Henson went missing on March 23, 1979, out of Tulsa. And Deborah Hagler hasn't been seen since October 1, 1979. Bordering state Texas also has three rule outs. Lisa Borden vanished from Big Spring, Texas, and was last seen in Lodi, California, around October 10, 1979. Christy Booth went missing on February 2, 1980, out of Midland. And Stephanie Bueller, who actually went missing a decade after Doe was discovered, was considered and ruled out, I think because of the number of tattoos that she had, including a red heart on her left shoulder. 
Barbara Monaco was also ruled out. She went missing from Virginia Beach, Virginia on August 23rd, 1978. And the final rule out was Mary Anderson or Mary Shondell, who disappeared from Gillette, Wyoming sometime in 1982. In 2014, she was connected to remains found in August of 1983, also in Wyoming. Her murder is still being investigated. So those are the official rule outs. But what about those who haven't been eliminated? WebSleuth users will often suggest missing persons profiles with similarities to John or Jane Doe's, and while I haven't compiled all the suggestions for the Lime Lady here, I do want to mention three of them. First is Mary Frances Gregory, a 19-year-old who left her home in Perry Sound, Ontario, Canada, on February 18, 1978, with a male acquaintance. She was on her way to California for a vacation, but never arrived at her final stop. The male acquaintance claims that he dropped her off at a bus station in Las Vegas about 10 days after leaving Canada. The route that they drove, according to him, took them through New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois, Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and then Nevada. Now, I don't know if they missed a couple of states because they took a plane from Illinois to Colorado, or if the states between these two are just missing from the list for some reason. Indiana is also missing from this list. If they did drive, Indiana should also be on this list, and after Illinois, the more likely routes to Colorado would have either been through Iowa and Nebraska, or Missouri and Kansas, which borders Oklahoma. The luggage that Mary had with her at the time she left has been recovered, but she's never been seen again. So here are the similarities between her and Jane Doe. She was 19, so she falls in the age range of Jane Doe, which was 18 to 25. She was 5 foot 3 and 111 pounds, so within the weight range, but a little shorter than Doe. She had a fair complexion and dark blonde hair. Not a lot of ties, but it's not out of the question, I think. The second suggestion I want to bring up was Margaret K. Holst, an 18-year-old who went missing from Omaha, Nebraska on August 4th, 1977, when she left her residence to go on a date with a boy that she'd recently met. After her date, he dropped her off near her home, and she's never been seen again. Similarities are as follows. She was 18 when she went missing, would have been 21 in April of 1980, so she falls in the age range. She stood at 5 feet 6 inches and weighed 125 to 130 pounds, which is closer to Doe's height of 5 feet 6 to 5 feet 7, and 115 to 120 pounds. She had red hair, Doe was described as having reddish brown hair, and her upper teeth were crooked, as were Doe's. There is actually nothing to connect her to this area, but again, I don't think it's completely impossible as far as a match goes. Which brings us to April Rose Zane from Frankfurt, Illinois, who was 17 years old on April 18th, 1977, when she went missing. That day, she was going to go into town to see a friend, but never arrived. She had run away before, mostly back to Chicago, where she had friends, but she'd never stayed away for so long. Here are the similarities between her and Jane Doe. She would have been 20 in April 1980, stood between 5 feet 4 inches to 5 feet 8 inches tall, and weighed 115 pounds. April reportedly had a long torso, which made her appear taller than she actually was. She also had red hair, facial freckles, and scars on her right knee and chin, in addition to an appendectomy scar right along her right hip. However, there's no mention of a tattoo for either April, Margaret, or Mary. And I want to emphasize that these were theories suggested by WebSleuth users. It doesn't mean Jane Doe is one of these girls, and it doesn't rule them out either. Unfortunately, time and technology may be the only chance that we have to know who the Lime Lady really is. She belonged to somebody. Somebody knew her. She had to have had friends, family. She might have been a foster child and uh, grew up maybe a runaway at some point and that could be one reason why nobody's really been looking for her all this time.
In 2013, the Oklahoma County Sheriff's Office embarks on a Twitter campaign to spread awareness and information on Jane Doe's case, in the hopes that someone might pry the investigation out of its icy depths. A year later, Doe's extracted DNA was sent to the missing persons database at the University of North Texas for comparisons, but there was no luck finding a match there either. Because Jane Doe was in early adulthood at the time that she was killed, detectives believe it's possible that she still has a living relative, perhaps a parent or a sibling who might be looking for her or wondering about a family member who went missing so many decades ago. Jane Doe, or the Lime Lady, was between 18 and 25 years of age, standing at 5 feet 6 to 5 feet 7 inches tall, and weighing 115 to 120 pounds. She had a fair complexion with freckles along her face and upper torso, her hair was reddish brown and shoulder length, and she had a tattoo on her left breast. There is a horizontal appendectomy scar on her lower abdomen measuring 4 by 1 centimeter, and she had crooked teeth, but extensive dental work done. Those dentals are available for comparison, so if you have any information on the identity of or killer of Jane Doe, you can contact the Oklahoma County Sheriff's Investigations Division at 405-713-1017. Special thanks to the Patreon family who actually voted on the Lime Lady's case for their January-February case poll. And two of the cases from the poll results actually tied for coverage, so there will be another Nameless episode case up sometime next week covering the other one, I believe. Patrons also, please check out the page for the latest post, which has your January livestream date announcement. I hope to see you guys there. And thank you all for giving the Lime Lady a moment of your time. So far, unfortunately, the killer's effort to conceal Doe's identity has kept law enforcement from answers. But if you happen to live in Oklahoma or near Jones specifically, I really encourage you to share the video on your social media accounts on the off chance that someone who knows something might see it and report it to the authorities. Please always remember to be respectful of the victim and the community in the comments, but I feel like I hardly have to say that anymore. You guys are always really great about that, so thank you. Um, I hope the Lime Lady's true name comes to light and that there will be an update sometime in the future and that we'll know who she is and that her killer will face justice. Thank you for watching the video, for helping me to spread the word about these cold cases, and for your continued support. Please stay safe, friends, and have a good night.